Greg Braden's key message is simple. Our beliefs and our emotions shape our reality. It's not just a spiritual idea, it's backed by science. The energy we generate through our feelings, whether it's love, fear, or gratitude, directly influence our health, relationships, and the world around us. Ancient cultures knew this, but modern society has disconnected us from that power. Braden is saying we all have the ability to create miracles by aligning our thoughts with deep, positive emotions. It's not magic, it's a form of spiritual technology. The real question is, are you ready to use this power? Stop waiting for external fixes. You have the tools within you. The feelings in your heart, when fully aligned with your desires, activate the change. It's about taking control and creating the life you truly want, starting from within. I hope you enjoyed this special presentation from Greg Braden and special thanks to our partner Liz Dawn from Celebrate Your Life for allowing us to use it exclusively on our YouTube channel. Believe. Yesterday we began with this flow chart, it's called the great spiritual mystery. The mystery that says something that we do in our lives triggers a process inside of our bodies that interacts with the forces of creation and affects our physical world. Something that you and I can create, a feeling, an emotion, a belief inside of our bodies interacts with the stuff that we can't see in the world and that modern science until recently hasn't even acknowledged and affects change in our physical world. We are born with the ability, the language, to speak through our hearts and influence, not control, not manipulate, not impose our will, but we influence the healing of our bodies, the peace between nations, the abundance, our spiritual abundance, our material abundance, the quality of our relationships, our romance, our friendships, the success of our careers, all of those things. That's why this work is so relevant to everything you do. There are people that I met in the lobby that said, well, I, they said, we usually don't come to spiritual conferences. And I said, that's okay, because what we're doing in here, from my perspective, spirituality is life. We are spiritual beings walking this earth. It's a mystery, truly, as to where we've come from. A lot of theories out there, the bottom line is nobody knows for sure. It's a mystery as to where we go when we leave this place. A lot of theories... A lot of my best friends are speaking here about what that means. James Von Prague even speaks to dead people on the other side. But we really don't know. What we do know is while we're here, we've got some time together. We've got some time together to explore this world. And in our exploration, we have created conditions and situations now that we have to deal with. And what our own science is telling us, and what the wisdom of our past has always said is that we're part of everything that we've created. And that means that we are part of any solutions that come to pass. That's what this flowchart is telling us. Something we do in our lives affects our physical world. If we do not understand how it happens, when it does occur, we call it a miracle. If, if we have a feeling and all of a sudden the breast cancer is healed, the doctor says, oh, well, that's a miracle. And they just write it off to a miracle. They say, you know, we can't explain it because... Because these relationships are not understood. And we mentioned yesterday, if we do understand these relationships, they're no longer miracles. It's a technology. And it's a technology that ancient cultures have used. It's a technology that indigenous peoples are still using today beyond the borders of this beautiful country of ours. And so my path has been as a scientist during the Cold War years of the 1980s, working in a nuclear missile program, designing software for the MX missile in Denver, Colorado. In my weekends and spare time, I was researching the text, finding out, hopefully, the information that would help us to create the world where we'll never have a war like that again. And what I'm doing to you is, to the best of my ability, bringing the essence of, of what I have found to share with you to add to your toolbox or everything you already know. And every one of you, you, you all could get up here and do a program just as easily about the things in your life. You might not have the same pictures, but you would have the experiences that you could share that are meaningful to other people. So I, I'm just acknowledging that, and I want to say how honored I am to be here today and that you would come and uh, allow me to share this day with you. And how much I appreciate your patience, because we're going to move really fast in some places, kind of slow in some other places. And I appreciate your trust in allowing me to lead you through this material. The reason that our modern world has been so slow in picking up what that flowchart is saying to us is because as good as our science is, we know that it is based in two false assumptions that were proven false only, only at the end of the 20th century and now the first years of the 21st century. 
two false assumptions. The assumption that everything is separate from everything else, number one. Number two, the assumption that what happens inside of our bodies has no effect in the world beyond our bodies. We now know it is the fact that we live in a world that is made of a shared matrix of energy. There's stuff. There's something that underlies this physical reality. We cannot see it, but it fills all space. There is no empty space. That something goes by many names. It's been referenced by many traditions in many different ways. We know it's there, number one. Number two, we now know that you and I are born speaking the language that influences that stuff. We call it emotion, feeling, belief, intent. That stuff has so many different names. We identified a few of these yesterday. Some physicists are now calling this field of energy the quantum hologram. Lynn McTaggart wrote a beautiful book a few years ago, and I'm actually uh, presenting with her in Hamburg, Germany, next month. Uh, Her book was uh, called The Field, simply is entitled The Field. Stephen Hawking is calling it the mind of God. The father of quantum theory called it the matrix, now being called the divine matrix, all names for the same field. So if you were not with us yesterday, this is the essence of what we did to help us understand that that field is there. And we arrived at this point. We said if we're going to use that field, if we're going to use the divine matrix, we've got to understand a little bit about how it works and speak the language it recognizes. And we're doing a little of that both yesterday and today. So now... Now, this gets to be an interactive program here because this is a choice point in the program. See, it says right there. (laughs) Choice point, but it's not just any old choice point. What city are we in for the recording? What city are we in? Chicago. Chicago. So this is the Chicago choice point that we put in last night. Okay, are you ready to answer a big question? Okay, here we go. The question is this. Do you want to stretch? Your awareness of what you believe about our world today. If you say no, it's a very short program. (laughs) So you almost have to say yes, okay? So whether you want to or not, just say yes for now, okay? Yes, okay, cool. All right, so my question is this. We have an opportunity. Do you want to explore the deep reality or, or the safe reality? They're both good programs and they're both a lot of fun. And they both have a button that goes with them. And either button, either button is going to give us a good program. But, however, before we can go into deep, I have to have your permission. So are we going to do, how many want the safe reality? It's fun. It's a good program. You want this one? Safe? Deep? Okay, we've well, got to help me out here. We've got to push that button. Are you ready? <laughs> it says we can't do it. It says our access denied. If you saw the movie The Matrix, that's the screenshot from The Matrix. <laughs> access denied. Well, we said deep. I wonder. Let's see. What else is it asking? We said we want the deep reality. Do we want the deep reality? Or, oh, do we want the really deep reality? <laughs> really deep? Okay, here we go. A couple of buttons here. So if we want really deep, we've got to push that red button. Can you help, help me out? Oh, okay. All right, we got it. <laughs> got to make it fun, right? This could be some really dry stuff, I'm going to tell you. We, now we, do, we do these programs. We do programs for elementary school, a very different language that I use. We do some for middle school. We do uh, some for high school seniors. We've got a seniors program. We've done some in um, nursing care facilities for elderly people who have a really short attention span. The key is big pictures and a uh, short program. <laughs> But this is the language I like to use here, so I'm more comfortable with what we're doing right here. So the deep reality is the growing number of mainstream scientists. These aren't like old retired guys sitting on a park bench feeding the pigeons on, you know, somewhere in the middle of nowhere thinking of a new project. These are mainstream scientists are beginning to suspect that our universe and our bodies and our lives actually work like a really, really big computer. As a matter of fact, not only are they suspecting it, MIT professor Seth Lloyd, who is the designer of the world's first feasible quantum computer, he doesn't say it works like a computer. This is a quote. He said the universe is a computer. It's a quantum computer. And in longer programs, we can explore precisely what that means and the parallels between the way a universe works and your body works and your laptop works are probably no coincidence. And the parallels are striking. 
They are astounding. But the bottom line for all this, you all know enough about computers to know that an electronic computer uses numbers to get things done, right? When you type an email, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, hello, Greg, with two Gs, you know that those letters are being converted into ones and zeros that go across the line somehow and get translated to someone else. That's electronic computer is programmed by numbers. Our consciousness computer is programmed as well, but it's programmed by belief. It's not the ones and zeros of numbers. It's the energetic patterns of what you and I create within our hearts. Does that make sense? Are you okay with that? In longer programs, we can go into a lot more detail. And if you're interested in the technical details, they're there. And when I share them with young people, what I used to say is it's very cool. But I've learned quickly that cool is no longer the word that young people use. You probably know more about that than I do. Well, it is sweet, and now they've graduated to another word that I don't even want to use on the stage. So I just either hang out with sweet or cool. One of those two words is what I'm going to use. I think it's very cool. The parallels between the electronic and the consciousness computers, both of them need programs to get things done. The programs, when you look at the way belief works, or you look at the way programs work, they are so similar. Belief literally is a code based on a language that you and I were born speaking in our hearts. Now, I think intuitively we all suspect that. We sense it. And we've heard it for a long time, you know, the language of the heart. But it's always been used more in a poetic sense. Now it's becoming very concrete, very, very tangible, uh, and very factual. So I've asked the question before, how much power do we really have to change our world, to change our lives, to change our bodies? How much power do you think we have? I know because you're in a workshop here, you're all going to say we have a lot of power. But, but how much power do you really believe? Let me ask this. How many of you believe that you were born into this world with a power that you have never fully utilized? Do you believe that? Do you sense? Okay, that's almost everybody in the room. Then let me ask the next question. If you have that power, how come you've never used it? We don't know how or... or We are so conditioned, even people that have spent their lives in monasteries halfway around the world where this understanding is supported day in and day out, they say our conditioning is so deep that we are powerless beings subconsciously that even they, when they're trained, have to break through the disbelief to access that inner power, to access what it's all about. This is a a quote. I love this quote. It is out of the first century Buddhist Sutra, the Mahayana Sutras, this is actually from the Heart Sutra, is what it's called, and it's a direct quote from the translation. It says that the reality of our world, whether it's your body, or whether it's our physical world, or whether it's our situation in life, reality exists only where we create a focus. The question is, how do we create the kind of focus that influences our reality? Where This is, this is where modern science now is only catching up with those ancient traditions, because science has discovered the force of belief. Scientists know that belief has a power, but scientists don't believe it. Science has found the force of belief, and they don't believe it. How many of you have heard something called the placebo effect? Everybody in this room, probably. If you're a medical student, you know that you get about 15 minutes of first-year med school where they talk about this little fluke called placebo, and then they don't talk about it anymore. It may be the basis for the healing of the last 8,000 years of human history. Because modern medicine is said to be only about 100 years old, but we've been healing ourselves for 8,000 years without modern medicine. What did we use? Well, this might give us some insights into what it is. The term was actually coined in 1955. H.K. Beecher, chief of anesthesiology at Boston's uh, General Hospital, Boston, Massachusetts General Hospital, published his landmark paper. It was called The Powerful Placebo. Many of you have probably seen it before. The bottom lines of the paper was that he studied a number of people who had undergone medical procedures, and he found that about a third of them healed from essentially nothing. And this led to a group of studies. And I want to share just how far the placebo studies have gone, if you are not aware of some of this. Those of you uh, that are less familiar with a placebo, placebo is when someone is given something by a person that they trust. It might be themselves. It might be a doctor. It might be a friend. It might be your parent. And they believe that whatever it is that they have received, either a substance or a procedure, 
will help them with a condition. They believe it to be true. That's a placebo. This goes so far, and if you have not heard of some of these, I want to share these with you. There's a cardiologist in Seattle, Washington. His name is Leonard Cobb. He took this one step further and used a placebo procedure in a heart, a heart procedure that is typically used for people that have a condition called angina. And the idea is that the blood flow needs to be increased in certain parts of the heart. What they typically do is they will go in surgically into the heart. They'll tie off a couple of arteries in one place to force the blood somewhere else. And it's got about a 90% success rate. So when someone hears that they are going to get this procedure and they know it's got a 90% success rate, they say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to be okay in about three hours. So here's what he did. I wouldn't want to be the patients. Here's what he did. He took the patients, he anesthetized them, he took them into surgery, he opened them up as if he were going to do a surgical procedure. But what did he do? Absolutely nothing. He closed them right back up. He stitched them back up. What do you think the effect was? The placebo surgery had exactly the same success rate of 90% as if the procedure had already been done, when in reality, nothing was done, and the only thing that changed was the people believed that something had been done. This has had such an impact on the medical community, they now have stopped the original procedure altogether. It's called internal mammary ligation. It's abandoned. Talk about this in the new book, The uh, Spontaneous Healing of Belief. But it goes even further than this. How many of you heard of the nocebo effect? It's the opposite of placebo. Placebo is where you believe something can help you. Nocebo is where you have good reason to believe something will harm you. This is a very famous study. It's ongoing today. It's the very famous Framingham Heart Study. It began in 1948. What they did, 1948, they took 5,209 men and women between the ages of 30 and 62. They had been evaluated every two years for cardiac risk factors. Now they're taking the children of the original people and the grandchildren of the children. So the study goes on across generations. Every two years, the bottom line, I know you're all bottom line people in here, right? You want, we don't want to spend any time doing anything. We just want the bottom line, right? Because this is the deluxe bottom line 90 minute Chicago celebrate your life program. That's why. Okay, so the bottom line, I got up at 3 o'clock this morning and wrote bottom line on there <laughs> just for this moment. So I want you to enjoy it. Enjoy my bottom line moment. Okay. <laughs> bottom line is this the women in the study who believed that they were prone to the heart disease, even though they may not be were nearly four times as likely to die from the conditions they believed that they would have than other women who had exactly the same risk factors but didn't believe that they would be affected. The only thing that was different was how they felt about what was happening. Well, scientists see this. Medical people see this, and they say, well, maybe it's psychosomatic. It's all psychosomatic. Well, it is, but what does that mean? What does psychosomatic really mean? Well, look at this. If you've never seen this study, this is a very rare study. It was only published a couple of years ago. Very, very powerful. Showing that our body believes what we believe to be true on the chemical level in the cells of our brain. Our bodies believe what we believe to be true. This was an unprecedented study of belief. It was done in the Turin Medical School in Turin, Italy. May of 2004. Interesting, it's done in Turin, Italy, right? You know what else is there? The Shroud, the very famous Shroud of Turin. If you don't know about the Shroud, we do an Easter program at ARE, Association for Research and Enlightenment, every year uh, on the East Coast, and you'll see some amazing images of the Shroud. But that's another program. <laughs> I had to work hard not to put it in here. Okay, here's what they did. Patients were given drugs that mimic the dopamine that naturally occurs in the brain to relieve pain. These were people that were having a lot of body pain. Some of them were, um, they had MS, for example, in some of the uh, patients in the studies. Others had undergone uh, chemotherapy. A lot of pain. So they were given a drug that would mimic the body's natural dopamine as if it were already there. And when that happens, the pain is relieved. Okay, so they knew that. Here's the, here's the catch. 
the drug has a lifespan of only 60 minutes. The drug only lasts in their body one hour, and then it's metabolized away. The pain comes back. The drug is no longer there after that hour. The patients didn't know that. So they were given this drug, and what they came to understand was every time they got the drug, they knew that the pain went away and they were going to feel better. Okay, well, this is a placebo study, so you know what they did. The patients were actually given a placebo that was saline. There was nothing else in there, but they were told it was the stuff that they had had before. And because every time before they had experienced the relief of the pain, when they got the placebo, what happened? Okay, well, you know that you know where this is going, but you may not know exactly how far it goes. They believed they were being, being given the same drug. In reality, they were given this simple saline uh, solution, a placebo. Now, here's what made this study different. In the University uh, Medical School in Turin, Italy, they had equipment to do brain scans. And they scanned the brain of the people after they received the placebo. And in fact, they were given nothing. But after they were given nothing, they scanned their brains, and their brain cells responded as if the dopamine was actually in their bodies. Their cells believed what they believed in their heart. This is a quote. They say, it's the first time we've seen the placebo effect at the single neuron level in the human body. And that tells us you can call it psychosomatic, you can call it psychological, you can call it whatever you want. The key is, in the bottom line, this is a bottom line crowd, is that when we truly believe, not when we just think it, not when we suspect, not when we hope, not when we wish, not when we're praying, for when we truly embrace the certainty that something is so, our bodies will respond internally. And now the physics is showing us that the effect extends beyond our bodies into the world around us. When we have a feeling in our heart, we affect the world inside of our bodies as well as the world beyond our bodies. Yesterday, we began a series of belief codes. They're pulled from the various books that are out there on that book table. This is belief code 11 from the spontaneous healing of belief that summarizes what we've just done here. It says, what we believe to be true in life may be more powerful than what others accept as the truth. If a doctor looks at you and says, you know, you don't look so good to me. You may not have much longer in this world which a doctor just said to a friend of mine recently, I think a doctor should never say that. That's a doctor's opinion, but there are a lot of factors that they are not accounting for. Here's where the danger is. If the person that hears that trusts and respects the doctor, what kind of an effect do you think it has on them? Or if a doctor says, now think about this, what if a doctor says, you know, I've never seen a condition like yours before. That's always what you like to hear, right? But I, I saw some new studies, and I think there's a new drug that might help. I really don't think it's going to help much, you, in your, your situation, but let's give it a shot. That doubt that has been introduced in the studies has shown beyond a shadow of a doubt to actually have a detrimental effect on the patient's ability to receive the benefit of what they're giving. And the truth is, it may not have much to do with the drug at all. It may have a lot to do with their belief their trust that something has been... You all have heard this. How many of you found this to be true? You or your kids, you start to get sick. And you say, I don't want to go to the doctor, don't want to go to the doctor. And you say, well, I need to be at a meeting in two weeks. I want to make sure I'm good for this meeting, so I'll make an appointment. And you're feeling really bad, and you get to a certain point, you say, okay, this is this bad. I definitely have to go to the doctor. As soon as you make the appointment, you get in the car and go, what happens? You start feeling better because in your mind you know that you're going to somebody that you trust that's going to help you feel better. And I'm not saying that they don't, but I think the way we feel about the choice we made has a lot to do with it. Okay, well, here's the rest of the story. <laughs> I just came back from a tour in Japan where my computer broke. I have a new computer, and this is its maiden voyage. And, uh, and there's stuff on the computer that apparently I haven't gotten rid of yet. <laughs> so what we believe to be true in life may be more powerful than what others accept as that truth. Yesterday, some of you were with me, some of you were not. If you were... What we're going to see is worth seeing twice. If you weren't, it's amazing to see, but we're going to take it one step further. This was an image from a woman in Japan, a 19-year-old girl who was diagnosed with a uterine tumor, uh, ovarian cyst is what it is right here. I'm sorry, it's ovarian cyst. And they're using these scans. These are thermal scans showing how much blood is going to different parts of the body. Some parts of the body, you want a lot of blood, brain, lungs, heart, certainly, but it's not supposed to be happening down here. There's so much tissue 
that is inflamed, that this, that's why this is showing up. Okay, so they brought this girl in to the room. They sat her in a room where the researchers were going to bring in a healer to work with her in ways that they'd never been documented before. So the young girl comes into the room. She is sitting on one side of a barrier. On the other side of the barrier is the healer. There's no communication. They've never met. No information is exchanged. The healer has no idea what's happening. The healer is simply sensing and feeling and empathing with whoever is on the other side of that screen. And you saw this. Time equals zero right here. This is where the young girl is in the room on one side of the screen. The healer's on the other side. Three minutes later, the healer begins a process, and look at what's happening to the tumor. Seven minutes later, the healer is still working with this woman, and look at what is happening. Now, you've all seen before and after pictures before, but the reason this was so powerful for me to see was because there was another group of researchers that were working with the brain of the healer so we could see what was happening with the healer while the healing was being affected. So here are the scans of the healer above and correlated to the actual healings as they're happening. And if you've never seen one of these scans, to orient you, you're looking at the crown, the head, the nose is pointing up. If you see a little bump right there on top, that's the nose, the ears are on either side. And what I find so interesting here is that when the healer comes in and sits down, There's no judgment about the right or the wrong or the good or the bad or the health or the disease of the person next to them, and there's no differentiation between the activity in the left and right brain. Look at that. There's no differentiation, left and right brain. And the overall activity of the brain is so low, it's right here at the bottom of the chart. In other words, not much is really happening in that brain consciously. She's gone into an altered state. But look at this. Once she begins the healing process, and then we're going to talk about what that healing process is. We're going to go back into the monasteries in Tibet, find out what they know about it. Then we're, going to, we're actually going to do some of this in here before the end of the day today, because it wouldn't do any good to talk about it if we couldn't do it, right? Is this the right workshop? Cool. Okay. So look at what happens. Now the healer begins to remember our flow chart, something we do in our bodies interacts with the forces of creation and affects change in our world. So the healer begins to do that something, and look at what happens to her brain. Look at this. All of a sudden, there's a differentiation between left and right brain. What's happening in the right brain, look at the activity level. It's gone from blue into green into red. Man, it's cooking right here. But look at the left brain. This is what I think is so cool. The left brain, the man brain. (laughs) Look at what's happening to the man brain. Look, it's going from blue to white. Is there any white on the chart right here? No. She's off the chart doing nothing with her left brain. This is not a thinking experience. It is an intuitive right brain experience experience that's created by feeling. Feeling is the only way to create this. Okay, and then is the and this correlates with where this tumor is disappearing. Now, when the tumor is gone, look at what has happened. There's almost nothing. I mean, there's so little happening here on the left brain. The right brain is doing all of this. It's a right brain heart-based feeling process. When I began to see things like this, my question was how? How do you create those kinds of effects? What is it that we do inside of our bodies that shifts the focus from what's happening in our left and right hemispheres into our heart? Now, I've worked with scientists who will disagree with what I'm about to say to you. Scientists will say you've got to use the brain to do these things because the brain is the only place that thinks. Okay, no jokes. So you got the joke. (laughs) I know it's being recorded, so I I, I have to not use my other slides. What we now know is that your heart has its own brain. The human heart, literally, this is not a metaphor, it's not figurative, it literally now has been documented with neural tissue, brain and spinal cord-like tissue, neurons in the brain. It has its own memory, and we're talking about what now is called heart intelligence, heart-based intelligence. 
And I want you to take my word for it. In just a moment, I'm going to show you why. I want you to see with your own eyes and hear today so that you can really embrace this. Why? It's so much more powerful for, to, to feel your way into healing, to feel your way into peace in your family, to feel your way into peace between nations or into the success of your career, or the abundance, your spiritual abundance or your material abundance. Your brain can do it, but your brain has to work so very hard because it was not designed to do what your heart is designed to do. And you're going to see why in just a minute. Before we do that, one more little summary slide. Some of you were not with me yesterday. If you were and you saw this slide and you said, huh, this is for you as well. Because what I want to do is define what I'm talking about when we say and use the word feeling. The ancients make a distinction between thought, feeling, and emotion. And this particular image comes directly from a Sanskrit text. So this is a Sanskrit image showing the energy centers, the seven energy centers of the body, but they divide them three above, three below, and there's one in the center. Where is that one in the center? What is the organ it's associated with? Absolutely. Here it is right here. The three upper centers, the communication centers, are associated with what they call thought or communication. But what we think about has very little power in our world, in our lives, until we breathe, until we imbue some force, some power into that thought. And you and I are built to do that through what we call the emotion of the lower energy centers. When we marry the emotion of these lower centers with our thought, now we have a definition of feeling. When we marry the emotion of these lower centers with the thought in our brain, what we do is we create what is now called feeling, and it happens in the heart. And the ancients said to us, they're very clear, that we're capable of only two primary emotions, love and whatever you think the opposite of love is. For most people, it's love and fear. Put your own words in there. If that doesn't work for you. The bottom line is this. When we have a thought in our mind, and I shared a story yesterday, my engineer friend, John, he had affirmations all over his house, all over his car, all over his cubicle, little post-it notes, millions of them, well, hundreds of them, that he said millions of times a day that all said exactly the same thing. My perfect mate is manifesting for me now. My perfect mate is manifesting for me now. And I asked him, does it work? He says, I say them a million times a day. I said, does it work? He said, no. <laughs> and I said, why? And his answer to that is the key to what's happening here. He said, no, it doesn't work. I said, why do you think it is? He goes, look at me. Who would ever want to be with somebody like me? I'm an engineer. And he did. He said he wears the same, and he, I'll vouch for this, he wore the same clothes to work three out of the five days out of every week. And his life was all about work. But that's the key. His thought was my perfect mate is manifesting for me now. In his emotion, he even didn't think that he was a good partner. So when he created his feeling, how could he possibly draw a partner into his life? Because the thought was, my perfect mate is manifesting for me now, but the emotion was the fear that he wasn't worthy of a, of a partner. And this is where the technology comes in. You could have the same thought, pump in a different emotion, create a different feeling, and create different effects. That's a technology. If he had the thought, my perfect mate is manifesting for me now, and the love of what his life would be like in the presence of that partner. Can you see how that would be a whole different effect, a different feeling? And it would probably create different experiences in his life. So if you weren't with us yesterday, that's a little bit of what we did. If you were, we talked about it a little bit differently. But this is the key right here. It all happens in our heart. Feeling and belief. Belief is a certain kind of feeling. In longer programs, we talk more about precisely how that works. Feeling and belief are very closely re related, very closely associated. So when I talk about beliefs and the placebo effects, or I talk about feelings and the monasteries that we're going to, we're talking about a heart-based experience. Can you see why that is? is it, are you okay with that? Make sense? Does it? Okay, good. So the question, how do you know if you're having a thought or if you're having a feeling? You ever wonder that? Mom and I have this, have this conversation all the time. Uh, can we bring our lights down to the second setting? Can we do the, um, we worked for your viewing pleasure, the romantic theatrical light setting here. Isn't that a great setting? Ooh, don't you feel different now? 
I'm going to have to talk differently. How do you know if you're having a thought or a feeling? This is one of the places that's really difficult. It's a very subjective experience. It's hard to talk about. A lot of, a lot of uh, speakers simply won't go there because it is hard to talk about. But I wanted to, in our 90 minutes there, I wanted to work with us a little bit just to give you a sense of the difference between a thought and a feeling. Are you okay if, if we do this a little bit? How many of you wonder, do you ever have a question about the difference between a thought and a feeling or a feeling and an emotion? How do you know? Well, you know the definition I've given them to you, but what does that mean in terms of an experience? And I think experience is the only way to really maybe differentiate between the two. So when we talk about a thought, for example, if you look at something, I'm going to come out here so I can see what you're seeing. So I'm not so close to the screen. Just for a minute. Can I come back here? Can I do this on the mic? I guess I can. Seem to be working. Okay. All right. Now, I'm where you are. When you see that, what you see is a white circle against a black background. Not too exciting. You're registering that fact. That's a thought. You're saying, okay, big deal. White circle, black background. Don't have much feeling about that, probably. Am, Am I right about that? When we begin to add color and depth and dimensionality, some people respond to that feeling. Some may not. I don't want to suggest one way or another. But if you start to give your circle some color, you say, well, you know, it's, it's looking a little more interesting. It's, it's got that violet or if it has some depth. And people send, seem to respond a, a lot to really bright colors. You begin to see things like this. But for pretty much this is a geometric form. You're probably not having a lot of feeling about that. Am I right? Okay. However, nature, using the same colors, often gives us a lot of feeling, and we respond well to nature, to sunsets, for example. If this were a really bright projector, that would be a really brilliant sunset. We begin to respond to those things. People, people's lives, people's experiences, and especially when they are in deep devotional experiences, seem to give us a lot of feeling. Nature like the ruggedness, the sheer ruggedness of a Tibetan glacier. That's a feeling-based experience. But we begin to see things like people. Now, when you see that, do you have a feeling about that man? This is a man uh, that we met actually in, um, in Nepal. He's a pilgrim. He had just walked eight months across the Tibetan plateau down into Nepal to be at the holy site where we had just pulled up in a bus. <laughs> feeling a little guilty. We got there in three minutes from the hotel, and he'd walked eight, eight months across the ice of the plateau to be there. But when we talk about people, it seems like the closer we get to them, the more we begin having the feeling, and we see the devotion in their eyes. Do you have any kind of feeling when you're looking at, at him? The mark in the middle of his forehead is a callus because the way he got to this site for eight months was not by walking, but by doing full body prostrations like this. See, that's the mark right there. That is actually a callus from doing these. And that creates a feeling. Can you feel the difference? It's more than just a thought. Did you see where you shifted? Something happened right there. You identify, you empath in some way. But every one of you is having a different experience, so it's hard to talk about it. You just know it's more than a white circle on a black background. You're empathing with his experience, with his thought, with what it took for him to get where he is. We saw a lot of these kinds of people in our, uh, our last trip. There are holy, holy men, sometimes holy women, called sadhus. Sadhus have renounced all their worldly possessions. They seem to hold their hands up like this a lot. Every time you see them, they're always doing this. They look like pretty intense people, right? Maybe not a lot of fun to hang out with. But there was one, this one right here. Doesn't he look like an interesting man? His body is covered with the uh, ashes from cremated bodies. And his hair was so big, I had to back up to get the rest of his hair in the picture. But he has a very, very intense looking man, isn't he? Okay, so I'm going to share an experience. I saw him. I walked right past him, took this picture. We made eye contact. And I had this, I I loved him. I just loved him in in a heartbeat. And I felt like I wanted to hang out with him. I walked past him. And as soon as I did, I had this calling. I wanted to see if he felt anything when we walked past. I was with our group. He looked so intense here. 
And I turned around and snapped the next picture and caught this rare moment that I think probably betrays something about him that he didn't want us to see. Because look how intense he is here. And look at this next image. (laughs) Okay, you're having a feeling right now. That's a feeling. That's a feeling that you're having in your heart. It's hard to put a, a label on it, but it's different than thinking about the white circle and the black square, right? That's a kind of a feeling. I want you to, to kind of get a sense of what this is all about. I know he's got a secret. See, I want to know what his secret is now. <laughs> My name is Liz Dawn, and I'm with Celebrate Your Life Events. And the presentation that you've been listening to was recorded live at one of our Celebrate Your Life conferences. And this program was created exclusively for Evan's audience. And I'm super thrilled to share this information with you. So come check us out. Take a look at all of our retreats and programs and conferences that we have to offer. Click the link below and hopefully I'll see you in person. All right, now let's get back to the presentation. Let me tell you a story. Stories are good to help us with emotion. Some of you have heard this story. Some have never heard this story. It's a true story. It's a story of life. Two baby girls. Two baby girls prematurely taken from their mother's womb in the hospital in upstate New York in the year 2003, I believe. You may have seen this. Any medical health care professionals in the room, you know what happens the moment that preemies come into the world. Now, if you can imagine, these two, these twins, they've been nestled inside their mother's womb next to one another, in this case, for seven months. Seven months. They were there. They heard one another's heartbeats. They felt the warmth of one another. They felt each other kicking one another. They felt the heartbeat and the warmth of their mother. All of a sudden, in a few seconds, they're pulled from that environment into the harsh, hot lights of an infant ICU. And what's the first thing they do with the kids? You tell me. Separate them, absolutely. And they don't just put them in different incubators. They put them in different plexiglass incubators hooked up to different equipment in different rooms in different ICU wards. And now they're completely alone, laying face down, their naked backs to the world. And immediately something began to happen. One of the girls was weaker than her sister. And in her ward, in her isolation, her vitals began to drop. She was failing And the nurse that was on duty followed all the protocols. Nothing helped. And she said, we're going to lose this one if I don't do something fast. She's going to die. She broke the protocols. Now, you know where we're going with this, right? Sort of. Maybe. And maybe not. (laughs) Because the lights are low and I'm using my different voice. Okay, the nurse broke the protocol. She unhooked this little girl from all the equipment. She picked her up, held her in her arms carried her into the ICU where her stronger sister was in her incubator. But the next piece of this story tells the story. And it's the story, I think, of who you and I really are. Because what I'm about to share with you cannot be learned. These girls were not here long enough in this world to learn what happened next. The nurse placed the weaker of the two who was dying face down on her tummy next to her stronger sister who was face down on her tummy. Both of their eyes were closed. The stronger one sensed. She sensed her weaker sister next to her, and she reached out with her arm and put her arm around her sister's back. And the moment that she touched her sister, all of their vitals stabilized. And together they got stronger and stronger and stronger together. Can you feel that feeling? That's a feeling. That's not a thought. It's a feeling. How come you're crying? I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking at tears right now. <laughs> That's the feeling. It maybe bypassed your mind. It touched something really, really deep in your heart. Maybe because it's true. Maybe because it's us. It's so primal, it's so elemental, it's so simple, and it's so powerful. So now's a good time to tell you another story. Maybe you saw this one, maybe you didn't. The ability to do surgical procedures on a fetus before they're born so that when they are born, the condition that may have impaired them is healed by the time they come out of the womb has reached advanced stages now. I think you're all aware of that. In the year, uh, I think it was 2000, this amazing 
documentation occurred of something that apparently happens frequently. We just don't get to see the pictures. What happened was this. There was uh, a young baby boy. He was in his mother's womb, and he had a spinal condition. So they were doing a routine surgery on this baby boy, doing a spinal operation. Now, here is the catch to the whole thing. The catch is that his mother was anesthetized because he's hooked up to his mother's blood supply. He is believed to be anesthetized as well. So here's the catch. What they do is they open up the mother's tummy, they pull her uterus out of her tummy and lie it on her chest to perform this procedure. So I'm telling you this now, so when you see the pictures, you know what you're seeing. Are you okay? They're a little, I put a warning up here. There's the warning, and there's the reason it's warning. It's actually very beautiful when we see what we're about to see, and I wanted to set it up before you do. Because while the womb sac was sitting outside of the body on the mother's tummy, and both were believed to be anesthetized. The most amazing thing happened. The doctor had opened the womb. He was working on this boy's spine, and all of a sudden, this boy reached with his hand out through the slit in the womb into the air, and he grabbed the doctor's finger. Now, there was controversy as to whether or not this actually happened. And I went directly to the source, directly to the site, and when you see what you're going to see, there's little doubt The doctor is holding the finger. There's no doubt that the finger is grasping consciously the hand. This is what happened. Look at this. Here is the womb sac. Here's the mother's tummy right here. Here's the womb. Here is the hand. If there's any doubt about what you're seeing here, this hand is firmly wrapped around that finger. And when the doctor tried to pull away, the grasp didn't give up. And he shook this little baby's hand, and then he put his hand back into the womb, closed it up, and he was born healthy and happy a few weeks later. And this little boy, this little boy now has a picture of his hand before he was born that very few people get to see. Isn't that a powerful story? It's a powerful story of life. Okay, so those are stories. They elicit a feeling. Do you have a feeling in your body? That's very different than looking at geometric circles and squares, or even beautiful mountains and sunsets. The stories about life itself. This helps us to understand the difference between thought and feeling. Because it's different for every one of you, you now have to identify that difference for yourself. What is it that feels different about these stories than looking at a white circle on a a black background? That's the language. That is the language that you were born with that speaks to the stuff our world is made of. Okay? So are you okay with that? What is it that makes that feeling so powerful? Why is that feeling, why does it have any effect beyond your body? Yeah, you say, okay, I'm feeling that, and I can see where it might trigger some brain chemistry in my body, but how, how could it affect this plant next to me, or how could it affect the healing of a person on the other side of a barrier that I can't even see? This is what I want you to see about that. This image is what scientists now believe the atoms of our world look like. This is what is called a quantum atom. It looks different than the atoms that look like little solar systems. There's no nucleus. There's nothing orbiting around anything else. There is a pulsation of patterns and zones of energy. The bottom line, in longer programs, we could talk more about this, but the bottom line to this is that the energy being created here is electrical energy and magnetic energy. You've all heard that before. We live in a world of electrical magnetic energy. This stage, my body, your chair, your bodies, the atoms of the world, we are made of denser and less dense electrical and magnetic energy. That's no surprise, right? Okay? So, it's the stuff that makes the world what it is today. This is so important, I put that word right up there. This is going to sound really obvious, but I want you to think about this. If you want to change an atom, you've got to change the energy of that atom, right? You've got to change the energy. Okay, the key is that if you change either the electrical field or the magnetic field of the atom, you'll change the atom. If you change the electrical field of the atoms in a human body, you'll change the way that body is is working. Or if you change the magnetic field of the atoms in the human body, you'll change the way that body is working. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question, but don't answer because I worked hard to give you three clues, and I want you to see all three clues before you answer. So, question. 
Don't answer. What organ in your body creates the strongest electrical field and the strongest magnetic field? Okay, but don't answer because I have a clue. Here's the first clue. What organ creates the strongest? (laughs) But don't answer. What organ creates the strongest electrical pattern and the strongest magnetic patterns? Don't answer. (laughs) And if you're just waking up and you're saying, what is he doing? What organ in your body is designed, the one organ that's designed to create the strongest magnetic field and electrical field in the human body? Last clue. (laughs) It's your heart. That's what it does. The pumping of the blood may be the least of what your heart does. May be the least. Look at this. These are brand new studies. These are less than, uh, I think they're only about two years old. Look at what the studies are telling us. But the heart's electrical field measured by the EKG is up to 100 times stronger than the electrical field in your brain. So scientists that tell me, I, I was doing a radio program two weeks ago, and they took callers after we had talked about this. And one of the callers said, Mr. Braden, you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> and I said, tell me more. <laughs> he said, everyone knows that the brain is designed to do this, but the heart has no, the heart doesn't have a brain, is what he said. The heart cannot do these things. And I said, well, you know, bless his heart. He simply was not aware of the new studies. And I shared this with him. I said, please. Uh, I said, I appreciate your, uh, the intensity of your emotion in the moment. <laughs> and, and please go out, look at the website, take a look at the research papers. Can we create change in our world with our brain? Yeah, you can. Remember back in the old days, back in the 60s, we had black and white TVs? I've still got mine, actually, but um, <laughs> I, I'm going to tell you, the world looks a lot better sometimes through black and white. But remember when we used to see things like Yuri Geller back in the 60s bending spoons, and he'd make it look really hard because the, the idea was it's got to be hard, remember? So they'd scrunch up Yuri or people like that. And he's a good man, and he, he, brought, he brought a lot of visibility to the fact that we can change physical reality without touching physical reality. And that's so I honor him for that. And he made it look difficult. So he'd scrunch up his face, you know, and, and he'd make it, oh, you know, like I'm going to bend this spoon. And, and if, I know if I had a colored TV, I would see like big veins popping up and his face would get really red. But it's not like that. You can do this with your brain. But look at this. Your brain is relatively weak compared to your heart electrically. Your heart is 100 times stronger electrically than your brain. Look at this. The human heart is about 5,000 times stronger magnetically than the human brain. So if your heart is 5,000 times stronger magnetically, 100 times stronger magnetically, and a change in electrical and magnetic fields changes our world and heals our bodies, doesn't it make sense to use our heart? makes tremendous sense to me. Feelings and beliefs produce patterns of energy inside of our bodies and our hearts, but those patterns extend beyond our bodies into the world around us. And that is why the feelings that we have are so powerful. And the irony is the very texts that tell you and me the power of human feeling and human emotion, those are the texts that were edited by the early Christian church in the fourth century, and the words that tell us these things were taken away. And we know that because we're finding them now in some of the most remote repositories of knowledge in the world today, the monasteries of the world. When we have those feelings, it changes our bodies, it changes the atoms of our world, and it does so because of our heart-brain communication. When our heart, every moment of the day, our heart's speaking to our brain, our brain is speaking back to our heart and flooding our body with chemistry. Our heart is sending a signal And the quality of that signal is called the level of coherence. So when the signal is really good, we say we have high coherence between our heart and our brain. I was trained as a scientist. When I began to understand that, my question was this. I said, how do you create that heart-brain coherence? And that was what led me into some of the most beautiful and remote and pristine places remaining on the earth today. It was at this monastery in 2005... Where we, I'm sorry, 1998 was the first time I was here, where I had the opportunity to meet this man. Now, some of you saw him yesterday. Remember I said this was the new 
younger abbot in his 80s that replaced the old abbot who had died. And so yesterday you saw the conversation I had with this man. What I want you to see now, this is the older abbot that died, who I had met years earlier. And it was this abbot in this particular monastery that answered the question so clearly When I asked, the same question I ask every time I had, every opportunity, every monk, every nun, I said, when we see your prayers on the outside, what are you doing inside your body? When we see you elicit a miracle, when we see you heal somebody in the room over there from sitting over here, how'd you do that? What are you doing inside your body? I said, when we see your prayers on the outside... What are you doing on the inside? And this is the man that said, you've never seen our prayers. He said, because a prayer cannot be seen. He said, you're not seeing our prayers. He said, what you see, what you see are the things that we do to create the feeling in our bodies. He said, the feeling is the prayer. The feeling is the prayer. The feeling is what gets things done. The feeling is where the miracles come from. Then he turned the question on me and he said, how do you do this in your culture? And that was when I began to realize in our culture, we lost the very texts that hold the words that tell us that feeling is the prayer. We know that because they've been recovered in the Coptic, in the Gnostic text, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Nag Hammadi Library, uh, other programs. We talk more about that. But that's what we learned from, from this man. It was in this monastery we went down and met with these beautiful monks. And it was here that we befriended one young monk. This little one right here. Some of you have seen this before. Some never have. So I got up at 3.15 in the morning to put these pictures back in. So I wanted you to see these. And this is a little monk. I said, you have a secret library in this monastery that tells us how to create those feelings. And he said, yes. I said, can we see it? And he said, no, it's not possible. And I said, please. There's a longer story, but I'm just giving you the bottom line. I said, please, he said, he said, okay, but I have to get the keys. Now, if you've ever been to Tibet, you know that time means absolutely nothing in Tibet. He said, wait right here. <laughs> so this little monk got on a bicycle and he rode 30 miles in one direction to get these keys right here and 30 miles back while we wait right here. <laughs> it was worthwhile wait because when he came back, he opened the door. And he led us down a long hall, past these beautiful Buddhas of compassion, past these beautiful prayer wheels that we rotate, and inside are hundreds and hundreds of of yards of linen with very sacred prayers all rolled up inside. And the idea is when the wheel turns, the prayer is rotated, and it releases the prayer in, as long as it's rotating, the prayer is being shared with the world. We walked past these beautiful prayer wheels into a dark room that looked just like that, I worked really hard to get that dark room. (laughs) And when the lights came on, this is what we saw. You're looking at the corner of a library. It's three stories tall. It's 12 feet wide. It's 1,500 years old. And here are the books that are in this library. Here's my hand with a flashlight right here. These are the Tibetan books that hold the wisdom of the things that we lost in our most cherished spiritual traditions 1,700 years ago. And I asked my little monk, I said, what's in these books? And he looked at me and he said, everything. (laughs) And I said, what do you mean everything? And he said, we have a record of every spiritual tradition that's ever come through this monastery. And I said, if you could bring it all together, what's it telling us? And it's telling us what you and I already know. He said, they all talk about a field of energy that connects everything. And they're talking about our ability to communicate with that field through our hearts. That's what these people have been doing over there all this time. It's leading to a new science, a new spirituality based in belief. Some scientists like this. Some are having a lot of problems with it. Entire careers are changing. Textbooks are changing. And the reason is because it's all based on what we saw about one hour ago in this Buddhist sutra, that our reality exists only where we create a focus. Our own scientists now are finding this beginning in 1909. It's called the observer effect. That where we focus our attention and the quality of our attention, what we're doing while we're looking into the world, the expectations, the feelings, 
the beliefs about that something are affecting our physical world. And again, longer programs, we talk more about all these. But this is the bridge between the old and the new, between science and spirituality, and the instructions for how we do these things are very precise. So what I'd like to do, I know I'm moving quickly. I want to get into one more monastery so we can have some direct experience in this room. We're not going too quickly, though, are we? Because this is the deluxe bottom line fast forward <laughs> seminar. So how do we do this? We've already talked about it. We talked about it yesterday. We talked about it here today. When we create a feeling in our heart, that feeling becomes the blueprint for what you want to happen in your world. Just think of it that way. So if you want perfect relationship, you want healing in the body, you want financial abundance, you want spiritual abundance, if you want to feel nurtured in your world, you want to feel loved in your life, you've got to feel as if those things are already present so that they can be mirrored back to you. When you have a feeling in your heart, you're creating the template in the fields that your heart creates so that the physical world can congeal around that field. Does that make sense? You okay with that? How do we do that? Feel as if the outcome already exists. This is precisely what our biblical... Te- this is the Gospel of Thomas, the lost Gospel of Thomas right here. The bottom line to the Gospel of Thomas in these, uh, these particular phrases is feeling as if your prayer is already answered, your body is already healed, your perfect relationship is already here, your abundance is present, as if they've, and give gratitude and appreciation and thanks for the things that are already there. And that is how we bring them into life. I'm going to go to a different monastery just for a minute. This looks like a very primitive monastery on the outside. This is in the Egyptian mountains, across the Suez Canal and the Sinai Peninsula, at the base of Mount Sinai. Coptic monks, they've been here, uh, Coptic Christian, they've been here 1,500 years. They bake their bread in the sun. They pump their water once in the morning. All the light is from olive oil that they use in this monastery. It looks really primitive on the outside, doesn't it? So I was not prepared for what I saw. We went into the main cathedral for the very first time. Look at what's inside this monastery. Can you believe that? And then I began to to think about this place, and I realized it's been there 1,500 years uninterrupted. They've had 1,500 years to decorate in this place. (laughs) They could put anything in there they want. It was in this monastery that is said to be only second only to the Vatican in Rome in terms of Christian and pre-Christian texts. And it's here that we began to find this library, and it's this library that holds many of the images, and some of you were asking me about these earlier. These are called illuminated manuscripts. This particular one is in the little book, Lost Mode of Prayer. Uh, I signed a couple of those earlier today. I promised you that you would see this. It's in these texts that we find some of the oldest versions of the the Bible, some of them made just 300 years after the time of Jesus. And we find in the original texts, we find the words that were lost that tell us how to create these experiences in our lives. How many of you have heard, ask and you shall receive? Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. The words that tell you how to do the asking were lost. But if we go back into the original Aramaic, we can find those words. You want to take a minute and do that? Just, just quickly. I want you to see those, and we're going to do something here in the room. If we go back into the original Aramaic, it literally says, and this is a translation from Neil Douglas Clotes in his book, Prayers of the Cosmos, ask without hidden motive and be. Be surrounded by your answer. Be enveloped by what you desire that your gladness be full. If you are being, what's happening in your body? If you're being enveloped by what you desire, if you're desiring nurturing and love from your family and you are enveloped by that, what's happening in your body? You're having a feeling, right? This is what he's saying in a 2,000-year-old text right here. Be surrounded. If you are being, it's not that you're doing something, you are embodying this experience. Be surrounded. Feel as if your answer is there. Feel as if what you desire is already present in your life. He's saying exactly the same thing. If that looks too religious for you, there is another very powerful scholar, Neville. How many of you studied Neville back in the early, uh, I think he died in 1974? 
an amazing, brilliant, beautiful, powerful, eloquent scholar from the Indies. If you've never read his book, The Power of Awareness, I'll invite you to do it. Each chapter is a page, and you'll think about it for a week. It's one of those kinds of books. Look at what Neville says. Neville says exactly the same thing. He says, you must make your future dream a present fact by assuming the feeling of your wish fulfilled. Assuming the feeling as if it's already happened. And he said exactly the same thing as those old texts. Does it make sense? You okay with where we are right now? Gratitude and appreciation is the way that we create those feelings in our bodies. Modern scientists have found that in the English language, the words gratitude and appreciation best approximate the feeling that we need to have to create coherence between our heart and our brain. But you already know that because your mom already told you when you go to bed every night to give thanks for the things that have come to you, the blessings every day. It's that gratitude and that appreciation that heals your body. It heals your body and gives you these experiences. When we create gratitude and appreciation in our heart, we are literally creating a coherence between our heart and our brain. Gratitude and appreciation are a way to do that. Okay, I'm going to catch you off guard. I need a volunteer. Don't think about it. Volunteer, you. Um, Your steps right over here. Now, have I ever met you before? Have we had this conversation before? No. Did you know I was going to ask you to volunteer? And I didn't ask me if I knew I was going to choose you. Did you know you are going to choose me? No, I didn't know. Okay. <laughs> Can we bring our lights uh, back to where they were? If I could ask you to sit here, please. Uh, and what is your name? Tammy. Tammy. Thank you for being here. And thank you for... This is our beautiful audience. Aren't they nice? Nice people. Audience, this is Tammy. <laughs> Tammy doesn't know what she volunteered for, but she may have an idea if she's ever seen the program before. There is uh, an organization that I've worked with since 1991, the Institute of Heart Math. If you're not familiar with Heart Math, I'm going to invite you to go to my website. You'll hear a lot of information about Heart Math on the website. The bottom line to what we're going to do, I'm going to share this with you, and we're going to do some things here. I'm going to hook you up to a little device and some software so we can see the changes in your body in response to what we're all doing in the room based on everything we've done yesterday and today. (sighs) What we're going to ask people to do, what I'm going to ask Tammy to do, is we're going to learn how to create a heart focus to move out of our minds into our heart. That is key. That's perhaps the most difficult thing for Westerners to do, is to get out of their head. Once we have that heart focus, there's a quality of feeling that we create in the heart, and there's a breath that goes with that. The Institute of Heart Math pioneered some research in the early 90s And they began publishing in mainstream peer-reviewed journals this diagram that shows a field of energy around the human heart that looks like a little donut. It extends between five and eight feet around every human heart. So we are all, if we're all within eight feet of one another, we're all literally touching one another's heart field in here. In longer programs, we can experiment and work with this. And we'll do it a little bit right now because it means that whatever you're experiencing Tammy's experiencing to some degree, and it's going to show up in her readings. And whatever she's experiencing, you're going to experience to some degree. And whatever we experience in here extends beyond the walls of this room because this field is linked to the greater divine matrix. And we could heal the whole planet in 15 minutes. Wouldn't that be a cool workshop? (laughs) All right, so what we have, the Institute of Heart Math is, uh, give me permission as an independent author to bring uh, a little piece of software that uh, is used in a lot of research medical facilities. This isn't the most high-tech way to do this, but I wanted you to see this here today because it's the Deluxe Bottom Line Workshop. So what we're doing is this. If we can measure any one of three parameters in Tammy's body, and we'll be very kind, it will tell us the quality of the signal between her heart and her brain. It will tell us the quality of her coherence. If we could measure her breath rate or her respiration or what is called HRV, heart rate variability, pulse transit time, any of those things will help us. They all correlate to the quality of the signal between her heart and her brain. So we have a little finger pulse cuff that has an LED inside. And what I'm going to invite you to do with your index finger, if you put the fleshy part of your finger over this little plastic diode to where it's firm and centered on there to the best of your ability. I'll give you just a minute to do that. 
And then the key will be for your hand to be motionless. So if you can find, uh, be comfortable here is fine. Or if you'd like to sit, okay, that, that's good like that. Okay, and, and we're doing this intentionally now because I haven't asked her to do anything yet and I don't want her to because we're going to do a baseline reading. So she is now hooked up to this machine. It's going to calibrate just for a second, actually for a few seconds. And it's going to begin uh, seeing up on top, we'll see her heart rate variability, HRV. We're going to see some things happening in the other windows here. In the lower right-hand side of the screen, and you can look now if you'd like, and then I'm going to ask you not to look. The lower right-hand side of the screen is we're seeing what are called coherence ratios. High, medium, and low. It takes a minute to correlate. High, medium, and low. Okay, the low coherence is going to be red. The medium is going to be blue. The high is going to be green. And most people, when you walk up onto a stage, you say everybody has low coherence. If you were to do me, I've got low coherence right now because we're not in our hearts. So it's very common to see 100% low coherence. It's not a test. It's not a contest. That's where things are right now. What I'm going to ask you to do, and I know you all were looking at her heart rate. Um, if my heart rate were up there, it's about between 118 and 128 right now because I'm working hard for you all. So it's not unusual to see the heart rate up initially a little bit at first. So we see what's happening right here. Each of these little blocks of time is 30 seconds. So she's now almost a minute and 30 seconds into her reading here. If she does a sudden movement, you'll see a jump in a little red line, and that's what you're seeing happening right there. Okay, so you're doing really good. Now, what I'd like for you to do, and we can all do this together, you can help because you're part of what she's doing here. The way that the ancients taught us to move our awareness from our head into our heart is by simply physically touching your sternum just above your heart. And when you do this, that physical sensation draws your attention from your mind into your heart. If you've ever spent any time in a monastery, what you'll see is they have a constant pressure because they have their hands like this. And they're physically touching they're physically touching their sternum all the time, keeping that constant pressure there. You don't have to do that. I don't want to be a big formal thing. I mean, when you most need to have this technology is when it's least optimum to do that. If you're driving your car down the freeway and somebody just cuts you off at the pass, you don't want to let go of the steering wheel, have your hands like this, and go like this. But you can reach underneath your seatbelt and just simply touch your heart. I do it all the time. Touch your heart. Bring your awareness to your heart. That's number one. Number two is to breathe. And just remember to focus your awareness. We don't have to do it yet. I'm just going through the steps. You'll focus your awareness where you feel that sensation. And you will breathe into your heart. And now here's the key. To the best of your ability, and this is different for everyone, what I'll invite you to do is to feel the feeling of what for you is gratitude and appreciation for something, for anything. could be anything. Okay, and I'm going to ask you to do those in just a moment. Before we do that, however, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes now, because if you watch the screen, you'll be mesmerized by the technology. So I'm going to ask you not to watch the screen. Are you a mathematic-type person? Okay, can you begin with 100 and count backwards by 13? Begin, if you want to do it to yourself or if you want to do it out loud, you can do it either way. Okay, so... How, how are you doing counting backwards by 13? Okay, so you've done well enough. It doesn't make a difference if you were able to do it or not. What is happening right here, you can see this. When I asked her to begin counting backwards by 13, she was right here. Look at what happened. Can you see that? That was a stressful request. <laughs> you can look if you want to see what happened. Here, here's what happened. You, you were right here when I asked you. It was right these last 30 seconds, right up here. And there was the peak right there. And then you got, in, you got into the zone and you started doing something. The key, it was a stressful, stressful request. Okay, so if you'll close your eyes again. Okay. And now, because you're, you're so good at that, if you can count backwards from 100 by 23. Okay. Now, I'm going to invite you to do it, all of us. If everyone can touch your heart center right now. Close your eyes, because if you leave your eyes open, you'll be mesmerized by that technology. Yeah. Well, I'll do this together. I'm going to do it with you. Thank you. 
Touch your heart center. Move your awareness into your heart. And from that place where you feel the sensation, begin to breathe in and out as if the breath were coming from that place. And it's important to remember to continue deep, full, yogic breaths. Push your tummy out a little bit when you inhale. Just push your tummy out a little bit. That draws the air, the breath of life, into the deepest recesses of your lungs. Brings your diaphragm down. And when you exhale, just pull your tummy in gently just a little bit. And while you're doing that, to the best of your ability, begin to feel for you what you would call gratitude and appreciation. And it's different for different people. For some people, they think of looking into the eyes of their children first thing when they wake up in the morning. And the children are so excited just because they woke up. For people who have followed a, uh, a deep spiritual path, they may think of looking into the eyes of their spiritual mentor, Jesus or Buddha or, or their, their teacher. But whatever it is for you, you can feel the feelings of gratitude and appreciation. Okay, and then if you want to slowly begin to open your eyes, take a deep breath and open your eyes. And I want you to see how quickly this happened. What you're seeing right here, and I'm going to stop it right now. You did really well. When we began this, when you first came up, you were 100% low coherence, which is what you would, I would expect from most people who are up here. And you settled in a little bit as I was speaking, and that's why I wanted you to come up before we did anything to kind of let you settle in a little bit. Okay, so that's your settling in right here. Then I ask you to count backwards by 13. You're right up there. <laughs> then you kind of got into that. And then right here, and look at the time. Here is, it's less than a minute. It's about a minute is what we did right in through here. Everything began to kind of level out, become more evenly spaced certainly than it was over here. But this is the key. In one minute, you went from just under 100% low coherence. You're now down to 75% low coherence, 22% medium coherence. And when you began to feel the feelings of gratitude and appreciation, you uh, already you were at 4% high coherence. And the longer that we do these things what will happen is we'll move into that higher and higher and higher coherence. The key is it happens so quickly. This is how quickly your body will respond. Now, what the Institute of Heart Math has found, they published this in the American uh, Journal of American Medical Association, JAMA. It's on the website. You can find the, uh, the articles. Is that when people are trained to do this for only three minutes, when you can feel the gratitude and appreciation for as little as three minutes, that is your DHEA level in your body, that is the precursor to all the other hormones in your body. People go out and buy this stuff at Wild Oats or Whole Foods trying to increase DHEA levels. Those DHEA levels will increase 100% in your body, and they will last that for six hours after you stop what you're doing, after only three minutes. And while the DHEA levels are up, the stress hormones of cortisol will decrease 23% in that same time, and all you're doing is having a feeling. That's it. All you're doing is having a feeling. And obviously, the more that you do this, the more effective it is. These are the kinds of feelings that heal our bodies. We've all had a healing to some degree in here right now. There was a woman in here yesterday who met me in the hall and told me about a healing that happened while she was watching the healing on the video that we saw yesterday, that video gave her body permission to heal itself, and it was spontaneous. We all are sharing a healing in here right now. You've done very well, and I'm going to say I think that's all we're going to have time for right now. So thank you very much. Can we give, give, a, give you a hand? And if, if you'll take your seat, and I'm going to wrap this up pretty quick here. And I know that was, uh, it was very quick, and we're at a conference, and everybody's in here, and we've, uh, we're nearing the end of the day on the last day. But it was important. I, I, I wanted just to share a little bit because that kind of give you a sense of, of what it's all about. It's important to move your attention into your heart to allow the intelligence of your heart to do what it knows to do. Once you're in your heart, to breathe from that space and to the best of your ability, the feelings of gratitude and appreciation are the feelings that heal. The healers, the woman that was healing 
the young girl on the other side of the screen, she did not know that girl's condition. She didn't know the sex of the person on the other side. She didn't know that there was an ovary problem or a cyst. She didn't know it was a male or a female. What she began doing was feeling the feeling of gratitude and appreciation for the health and vitality of that woman as if it was already there. And you and I can do that for one another every day of life. This is the great healing that we can give one another is to see one another in our highest light, regardless of what the illusion of life is giving us to look in. And don't buy in to what the illusion of life is showing us. We don't have to deny it. You can say that is a possibility in this moment, and you know that there's much more for whoever it is that we're working with, whoever it is that we're healing. Has what we've done today made sense to you? Is it okay? We go too fast, too slow? Good. What we're doing is we're showing that that flow chart, something we do in our lives affects our body. That something is the power of feeling and belief. It's focused on our hearts. It has physical effects in our world. It's called the great secret everyone knows except the science of the West. Scientists now are catching up with it. And this is, I think, the value of going in and honoring the indigenous peoples of our past because they've held this wisdom in a non-technical language that now gives meaning to our science. We asked earlier, who are we? We're reality makers. The key is we can make only what we believe to be true. This is the great secret of feeling into existence, and it's a power that lives in every one of you. It lives in every one of us. And while this brings our program to a close today, it's actually the very beginning for where we go from here. Because I learn every time I'm with you, and my prayer is that we've offered something useful and meaningful to you in here that you can take to those that are sharing you with us for a little while today. Thank you for your time in here today. Thank you. Thank you. For another amazing Greg Braden video, check it out right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. We tend to live our lives based in what we believe to be true about ourselves, our world, our capabilities, our limits, would, would you agree with that? That 